Well, thank you very much, Vince, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you can see, I'm uh, role modeling the dress code for the afternoon as it heats up. Um, as uh, the Secretary of State said, we have now got a fairly long-standing collaboration with the government to promote the industry, not just in um, publicity terms, but in, concrete, uh, action, in terms of concrete actions. And the history really goes back to about five years ago when the industry was in decline um, and uh, was hollowing out. And in the, I wouldn't say the Automotive Council has uh, rescued the industry. The companies involved have done that. As Vin said, the Automotive Council has played a small role and created, I think, a catalytic uh, role in motivating investors to decide to invest here in the UK. Um, so what are the roles of the Automotive Council? Well, you can see them on this slide here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous strategic dialogue between government and the automotive industry here in the UK, focused around um, optimizing the competitive advantages and the case for investors in the UK, creating a more compelling investment proposition. We also need to develop uh, a stronger and more competitive automotive supply chain, as uh, Vince referred to. If you look at the history of the industry, it's the supply chain that are hollowed out the most. Whilst we carried on assembly vehicles here, we were losing the value chain that underpinned the final assembly. And then we decided that we would uh, use technology as a source of differentiation, a reason to invest here in the UK. And we produced uh, the roadmaps for technology that are consensed amongst the industry and identified within those roadmaps key technologies where nobody is in a, partic in a particularly good position elsewhere in the world and the UK has a strong competence and a basis upon which to build, or is already in a very strong position. And I'll, I'll briefly outline those in a second. We, uh, lastly, we wanted to work on communications and promote, user, using the government as an endorser, promote the strengths and the reasons why the UK industry is, is a strong proposition. We talked a bit about supply chain development, and uh, last year we did do a report on supply chain, We've been working on the outcome of that uh, report over the last uh, 12 months. And uh, to do that work, we've established five work streams, which we'll touch on in a minute. And those work streams include a really good cross-section of different kinds of people, not only from the industry supply chain, right the way down through the tiers, but also well supported by uh, government departments and also by the SMMT and other experts. So let's have a quick look at those supply chain uh, work streams. One of them is optimizing competitiveness of the UK supply chain. We have a lot of strengths in the UK, R&D, flexible labor force, a skilled labor force, uh, but we're still not fully competitive, and part of that is scale. Closing the sourcing gap between tier one and tier N. So we find our tier ones are really well suited up to support the OEMs in the UK, but as you drop down behind the tier ones into the tier twos and tier threes, actually internationally, they're a lot weaker in terms of competitiveness, and the tier ones don't always do as good a job as we would like them to do, looking after and developing the tier two and beyond supply base. We want to encourage entrance and re-entrance into the UK, particularly in R&D and what we call clever components. So yes, there are a lot of tier ones in the UK assembling stuff just in time, but too much of the stuff they assemble is designed and produced abroad. And we want to repatriate some of that, not necessarily by asking them to close a plant in a foreign country and build a new one here, but rather, capitalize on the wave of technical change. And where a plant needs replacing anyway, build it here. And a really good example of that is perhaps is the Nissan battery plant in the Northeast, where we, we needed a battery plant in Europe. And Nissan fortunately decided that the UK was the right place to put that battery plant. Identifying and advancing common opportunities. This is a really interesting old, uh, initiative. Most purchasing decisions at the moment take place inside a company in a global context. Usually in a headquarters, with the few noble exceptions of which Jaguar Land Rover is the largest, uh, outside the UK. And what we wanted to do was see if we could aggregate the demand for given commodities within the UK and start a different conversation with the supply base and the OEMs. And we can only do that with the help of the UK government because the UK government can facilitate that process and not only make it more uh, neutral, but frankly keep, you know, keep us all out of jail. Um, and the last one is access to finance. On the back of all these tremendous investments by the OEMs in the UK, re recapitalizing and growing their, their ca uh, capacity here, we want to make sure that suppliers are able to take advantage of that. Oftentimes they tell us that the reason they can't is they can't get finance to finance the investment required to follow the OEM's investment. 
We've started a, a significant dialogue with the financial services sector to try and see if we can help in some way solve that problem. As, um, as the Secretary of State said, we've had a really good track record in recent months of uh, significant OEM investments here in the UK. And our survey of uh, vehicle-based manufacturers um, s really says that these, ma these manufacturers would like to source a lot more here in the UK for, for a variety of reasons of which uh, Vince outlined some of them earlier. Our most recent survey suggests a demand of at least three billion worth of parts per annum at current vehicle output rates. That's without considering the growth of vehicle assembly that is programmed by many OEMs in the future. And it's not concentrated in a very narrow area. It's over a wide range. And some of the components that we're talking about, the component groupings, are shown on the right-hand side of the slide on, on the screen now. There is, for some of these, significant existing UK competence and capability. And we think we can build up on that. But for others, capability is very limited, and it will require significant new investments. And for many, there will be a need for a lower tier of supply, and the Automotive Council is now working on exploring exactly what that looks like and how we can help. So what are the next steps? Firstly, to start disseminating this material widely, and you've seen some of the start of that this morning. Identify some of the candidate uh, relevant tier one companies that could participate in supplying this uh, unmet demand. And then with the uh, offices of BIS, develop an engagement plan to talk individually to these candidate companies. There will, there will be another high level of round of engagements at the Paris Motor Show, uh, which myself and uh, Mark Prisk will uh, spearhead. And then we will replicate this work stream down with the, with the tier ones to promote the UK supply base down below tier one, i.e. tier two, tier three, and of course, the SMEs that can come in and the slipstream of that work and get access to market with their unique technologies. Now, access to finance, I mentioned, was a significant uh, barrier to some of the suppliers coming on with taking advantage of this opportunity. We don't have any magic silver bullets here, so don't get overexcited, but we are looking carefully at seeing what we can do to help. We have begun an engagement with the banks and held a workshop at Biz, facilitated by Biz, um, with both volume and niche OEMs, and tier ones, and of course the tier two suppliers. And what we identified, not surprisingly, was a real kind of misunderstanding between the financial service sector and the different strata within the automotive sector. And that really has resulted in a, a weak appetite for lending amongst the financial services sector, and I would say even a lack of, a lack of willingness to dedicate resources and build, ex build up expertise uh, aimed at the UK investment opportunities. So we're continuing this engagement in the coming weeks at the senior level, the British Banking Association and also the UK Clearing Banks, to try and re-establish some strong relationships to modernize what, is it, what we can see as a very outdated image of the sector amongst some of these institutions. And then to work from that basis to identify mutual needs and mutual opportunities uh, to move things forward in the right direction. But we're not only relying on financial services to help with the, with the funding gap. As you all know, the government has also put significant amounts of money out there in the form of various regional um, growth funds. And as you probably also know, the automotive sector has been particularly effective and successful in participating in those funds and accessing uh, some of that help. And uh, I know from a number of uh, the uh, round one and round two outcomes that the RGF fund has made a significant difference, not just you know, in changing the business case, but perhaps more importantly, in signaling the real commitment of the UK government to helping companies do well here. And lastly, as, uh, as the Secretary of State said, there is now the start of our advanced supply, manufacturing supply chain initiative, uh, which I, I hope uh, will, will be successful in its first incarnation and will go on to encourage us to do some more. Okay, so that was a bit of an update on the supply chain. Now let's switch uh, to the you know, equally important and sometimes regarded as slightly more exciting uh, area of technology. As I mentioned earlier, we've tried to skim through the entire technology landscape and find five strategic technologies which we want to really concentrate investment in and growing a differentiated position here in the UK to give all kinds of companies around the world reasons to either invest here or, at the very least, to buy from here. And these are the ones shown on this page. Uh, it's fair to say in our initial discussions, we had a lot of, of, of sort of tension between the, uh, on the first one, internal combustion engines, 
There was a view, a widely prevailing view, even amongst government, that we should abandon the internal combustion engines as quickly as possible and move to the end game solution, which was hybrids and electric vehicles or hydrogen and fuel cells or whatever. And whilst I think the industry broadly agrees that if you look in the long term, we are going to have to get out of fossil fuels to get down to 40 grams per kilometer, and we are going to have to have large fleets of electric vehicles, biofueled vehicles, and hybrid vehicles, and of course, hybrid, uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. But if we don't work on internal combustion engines, we will give up a huge competitive advantage we currently enjoy, and there is a huge opportunity to do a lot better on internal combustion engines than the industry has done in the past. Why? Because the engineers have only been told in the last 10 years that CO2 is really important, and the, and the customer and governments are willing to spend a lot of money on making it better. And the engineers are pretty good at responding to challenges like that, and I think we all need to be uh, very proud of the progress that's been made by the industry in radically reducing CO2 even before we get to intensive electrification. Now, having said that, you know, we need to get down to 100 grams, then 80 grams, and then we need to halve it again. So it's very sensible, I think, to invest in the next technology, which is energy storage and management. And we've got to do this now because it's a long game. Nobody's really good at it yet. And whilst we're busy exploiting internal combustion engines, which we know very well, in parallel, we have to be investing in the next generation. Energy storage and management is one area. We notice we don't say batteries. We say energy storage and management. We're interested in you know, how do you store gases, how do you store electrical energy, how do you store mechanical energy. Uh, we're agnostic. We want the competition, the technology competition, to produce you know, the plethora of alternatives, and then the best ones will emerge. Don't forget, it took 30 years for the internal combustion engine to become the dominant uh, solution 100 years ago. Uh, no re I think it'll be quicker this time, but there's no reason to believe we can pick the winner now. Let the competition thrive. The next one I've got down here is intelligent mobility. This is a little bit different approach. This is looking at beyond the vehicle at the wider transport system and looking at the uh, opportunities to reduce emissions, to reduce congestion, and to improve safety by having a much more intelligent uh, mobility system which incorporates such things as vehicles talking to vehicles and using swarming theory to decide what the best uh, uh, population solutions are. And that uh, opportunity, we had a recent conference on, which I'll talk about in a minute, where we got good support from government moving that agenda forward. Then down the left-hand side, I've got another one of our existing strengths we want to reinforce and build on. That's lightweight materials and structures, both in the vehicle area and in the powertrain area. Uh, we're really good at that. We already have uh, the world's best aluminum structure capability in Jaguar Land Rover. We have a very strong um, specialist vehicle sector, sports cars, luxury sports cars, motorsport, and of course we have a strong aerospace sector. So collectively, the UK is very, very good at lightweight structures and uh, uh, you know, amongst the best, the very best in the world. So we want to exploit that because whatever you do to reduce weight of a, of a vehicle, you will help the CO2 equation. And lastly, I've got electric machines and power electronics because we think that whatever happens in terms of future powertrain architectures, electricity will play a much more important and growing role. And the way that electricity will be managed and converted into uh, mechanical energy will therefore be a core node of technical capability going forward. And don't forget, in this area at the moment, the auto industry is largely using stuff that was developed from static applications, which is adapted to mobile applications. So it's not particularly efficient, it's not particularly light, and it's not particularly small. That is changing rapidly as technologists start to get to work on the mobile versions. So that's our technology um, uh, five key areas, and we're busy working away at those, creating detailed technology roadmaps, i.e. within those high-level headings I've given you, which are the specific opportunities that we want to focus on. Uh, looking at the technology readiness pipeline and having a common language about that, Identifying and promoting collaboration opportunities. The Technology Strategy Board has been absolutely key in helping us do that. We've been working very closely with them, and I think that has been a, a real part of the success story of the way the industry and government have been able to work together successfully. And, of course, communicating what we're doing and proposing ideas for market development. We've published our technology roadmaps for commercial vehicles, for cars, for off-road and off-highway vehicles. We've published our guidelines to have a common language for technology readiness. We held our Techno Intelligent Mobility Summit uh, in April with Secretary of State for Transport as well as uh, for Biz, both as uh, keynote speakers. 
and we're following up on the wide range of opportunities that surfaced in the UK in that international conference. Um, we held a Meet the Engineer event uh, last, uh, the month before last, and over 56 million pounds worth of R&D projects in the automotive sector has just been announced in the latest TSB Low Carbon Vehicles Initiative. So, in conclusion, the Automotive Council is helping to provide leadership in this sector. It is a strong and collaborative strategic dialogue uh, that is being built and has been built between government and industry and between industry and industry. And don't overlook that. This is not just the industry as one body talking to government. This is also, I would say, uh, more, even more than that, it's the industry meeting in a different forum and having a different kind of conversation. We've seen strong new investment by OEMs, really evidence to international investors that really experienced players who know the UK very well are investing heavily in what they know to be good. And that in, in enhances our credibility enormously when we go and talk to people who aren't here yet. We see significant opportunities to capitalize on this in the UK supply chain, and we are working very hard on supporting those companies and those institutions that are helping to define the next round of disruptive technologies, uh, which will change the, lo change the uh, vehicle, another big step on towards the low carbon transport system we all want to have. Thanks very much for your help.